Welcome to UMAT Made Easy, implementing Phone Music Plasticity Model. In this comprehensive course, we demystify the complexities of the user material subroutine UMAT and take you on a journey to master the implementation of the Phone Music Plasticity Model. Whether you are a seasoned engineer looking to expand your expertise or a student eager to delve into the world of computational mechanics, this course is designed to make UMAT accessible and phone music plasticity understandable. Join us as we simplify the intricacies and empower you to harness the power of UMAT for accurate material simulations. In part one, we will embark on our journey by exploring the fascinating world of tensors and their profound importance in the field of mechanics of materials. Tensors are the mathematical framework that allow us to describe and understand the complex behavior of materials under various stresses. In part two, we will dive deeper into the different tensor notations and discover their significance in deciphering how materials respond to stress. These notations are like the language of mechanics, helping us make sense of the intricate behaviors of materials under different conditions. Part 3 is all about stress invariants. We will learn how these invariants can be used to determine the state of stress within a material. Understanding stress invariant is crucial in predicting material failure and ensuring structural integrity. In part 4, we will introduce you to the phone Mises yield criteria, a fundamental concept in material science. We will explore its applications in determining the yield strength of the material. Phone Mises Criterion is a cornerstone in material design and analysis, providing valuable insights into when materials will yield. Part 5 is where theory meets practice. We will demonstrate the numerical implementation of Phone Mises plasticity with no hardening. We will get hands-on experience and see how this theory can be applied in real-life scenarios. In Part 6, we will take it a step further by diving into the coding of Phone Mises plasticity. We will explore the algorithms and steps involved. By the end of this section, you will have a solid understanding of how to implement this in Abacus. Part 7 is all about validation. We will rigorously test our implementation by comparing it with default Abacus material model. This step ensures that our custom implementation is accurate and reliable. In Part 7, we will delve into the implementation of phone Mises plasticity with isotropic hardening. Isotropic hardening is a crucial concept and we will break it down step by step. Part 9 is where we get hands-on again as we delve into the coding of phone Mises plasticity with isotropic hardening. We will explore the coding intricacies and ensure you are well equipped to implement this advanced model. Finally, in part 10, we will put our implementation to the test once more. We will validate it through a thorough comparison with the default Abacus material model. This ensures that your custom model is reliable and produces accurate results. Thank you for joining today on this exciting journey into the world of tensors and their applications in stress analysis. Get ready to unlock the full potential of Abacus and enhance your understanding of materials behavior. Let us first understand tensors without any mathematical symbols and equations. The best route to understanding tensors is to begin by making sure that you are solid on your understanding of vectors. If you have taken any college level physics or engineering, you probably think of a vector as something like this. An arrow representing a quantity that has both magnitude and direction. Where the length of the arrow is proportional to the magnitude of the quantity and the orientation of the arrow tells you the direction of the quantity. So, in general, vector is something which has a magnitude as well as a direction. As an example, the black arrow is a vector representing the distance, magnitude, and direction arrowhead in terms of longitudes and latitudes. But vectors can represent other things as well such as an area. The length of the vector proportional to the amount of area, the number of square meters in the area. And then you make the direction of the arrow perpendicular to the surface, as you see on the figure. So in this way, this can represent an area as well. So vectors can represent lots of things. But if you want to take the step beyond thinking of vectors representing quantities with magnitudes and directions, 
to understand that vectors are member of a wider class of object called tensors then you have to make sure you understand vector components and basis vectors if you are even going to think about components of a vector you better get yourself one of these coordinate systems this represents a coordinate system in this case i picked the simplest one with the x axis the y axis and the z axis all meeting at right angles this represents the cartesian coordinate system and the thing to remember about coordinate system is they come along with coordinate basis vectors you probably run into these as unit vectors and the thing to remember about these little guys as they have a length of one one of whatever the units are that you are going to express the length of your vector in so it could be distance it could be velocity it could be speed the direction of the basis vector or unit vectors is in the direction of the coordinate axis so this might represent the unit vector in the x direction that's often called x little hat over it as you see here or sometimes i hat that's the x hat unit vector it points in the direction of increasing x coordinate likewise y hat sometimes called the j hat unit vector points in the direction of increasing y axis which is the direction and the z hat or k hat unit vector points in the direction of increasing z once you have the coordinate system and the unit vectors in place now you are in a position to find the components of your vectors how exactly you you're going to do that i think it's easiest to understand how to find the vector components if you begin with a vector in the xy plane so i'm going to lay this vector in the xy plane at some angle to the x-axis here you go in order to find the y component i am going to project this vector onto the y-axis similarly in order to find the x component i am going to project this vector onto the x-axis and how am i going to do that here's one way i want to use this torch here as you see on the screen to project the vector onto the x and y axis firstly i'm going to shine the light perpendicular to the y axis that is parallel to the x axis and look for the shadow of the vector on y axis which is this one black line here that will be the y component of this vector as you can see the shadow of the vector on the y axis ends right here this is the y component of the vector if i make the vector have a greater angle to the x axis so if i'm increasing this angle notice the shadow moves this way so so the vector will start to move in this direction the y component is getting is getting bigger because this vector is moving in this direction and this shadow will start to increase and if i make the vector lie entirely along the y axis this means the angle between this vector and x axis is 90 degrees or right angle then the shadow and the vector are the same length and the y component is the length of the vector in that case so your vector length is equal to the length of the y component of the vector now i have got my light shining perpendicular to the x-axis and parallel that is parallel to y-axis and the shadow cast by the vector onto the x-axis gives me the x component of the vector notice that if i increase the angle to the x-axis and decrease the angle to the y-axis so I'm moving the vector in this direction. Your X component will start to get smaller. Another way of visualizing the vector component is to ask yourself to get from the base of the vector to the tip of the vector. How far do I have to go in the X direction? And how far do I have to go in the Y direction? In other words, how many X hats unit vectors or how many Y hat vectors or J hat vectors unit vectors would be would it need to get from the base to the tip of the vector so i can show you this if i get rid of these axes and just line up some of the x hat base vectors and some y hat basis vectors so in other words this vector is made up of five x hat vectors one two three four five x hat vector vectors plus four one two three four y hat vectors that means that instead of drawing an arrow for this vector you can simply say five of these vectors plus 
four of these vectors. And if you want to be complete, since there is no z component of this vector, zero of the z head vector. And that is the same as this. So in other words, this is perfectly valid representation of that vector. And of course, if you know the basis vectors, you would you wouldn't even have to put these on. You could simply use these components as your vector. You could write it in a little array. Like this. You could even stack them up and put a nice parenthesis around it in this way. This looks just like the way you see column vectors written. So these are the column vectors which has three components x hat vectors, y hat vectors, and z hat, z hat vectors. x hat vectors, y hat vectors, and z hat vectors. Of course, these three components pertain only to the vector we had on previous slide a minute ago. To generalize this vector to capital A, for example, we can replace these components with A subscript X, A subscript Y, and A subscript Z. Of course, A sub X is the component pertain, pertaining to the X hat vector basis vector. A sub Y pertains to the Y hat basis vector, and A sub Z pertains to the z hat basis vector notice that we need one index for each of these because there is only one direction indicator per component so this is what makes vector tensor of rank one so it has only one index you will see in a minute why it's so powerful to represent tensors as this combination of components and basis vectors but first i want to show you some examples of higher rank tensors This is a representation of a rank 2 tensor. Notice that instead of having three components and three basis vectors, we now have nine components and nine sets of two basis vectors. Notice all that components no longer have a single index. They have two indices, AXX, AYXY, AXZ, and so on. Also notice that the components no longer have a single index. They have two indices. Why might you need such a representation? Consider, for example, the forces inside a solid object. Inside that object, you can imagine surfaces whose area vectors point in the x, in the y, and in the z directions. On each of these surf types of surfaces, there might be a force that has a component in the x, or in y, or in the z direction, as shown here. So, to fully characterize all the possible forces on all the possible surfaces you need nine components each with two indices referring to the base vectors so for example a sub y y which is this one might refer to the y directed force on a surface whose area vector is in the y direction so if this is the y direction force and this is the area vector in y direction or normal to y direction then a by y would represent that similarly a sub y x might refer to the x directed force on a surface whose direct area vector is in the y direction and so forth this combination of nine components and nine sets of two basis vectors make this a rank two tensor i think i have already bored you enough with vectors and tensor but i hope you now understand what tensor really means and you should be able to explain what does rank one rank two and so on tensor really means and what does rank two really means in terms of indices and how you can relate it with the physical materials so let's now look at the tensor notations which will be used in this course and try to pace up the course and your learning in this course, we shall use tensor notations for most part of the course. Consider a rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. The axes are denoted by OXI, where I varies from 1, 2, and 3. So we have coordinate axes as x1, x2, and x3. The unit base vectors are denoted by EJ. And again, in that this case, the J is from 1 to 3. So we have basis vectors as E1, E2, and E3. These are the same as X hat, Y hat, and J hat in the previous part. 
Latin indices i, j, k have a range of 3, that is, can have a value of 1, 2, or 3. First order tensors are written with one index, for, for example, u, j, v, k, and so on, as I explained in the previous part. While they have three components, so it can have, you, you can have u1, u2, and u3 as a component as relative to a rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. Second order tensor are written with two indices, so x, i, j, t, and m, s, i, j. These are the examples of second order tensor with two indices. And they will have nine components as I explained in the previous part which are defined relative to the rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. An mth order tensor is written with m indices. A repeated index means summation over the range of index. For example, sigma kk would mean sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3. Remember, k can have a value from 1 to 3 in rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. Similarly, TII would mean T11 plus T22 plus T33. So you have to add those components together. A tensor quantity cannot have an index that is repeated more than twice. So in the above example, you had two indices. They can repeat, but more than if you have three or more indices, then the indices cannot be repeated more than twice. Otherwise, it's wrong. Something is wrong. So for example, you cannot have sigma sub KKK or L sub I J J J or T sub I J J sigma J K. So again, J is repeated thrice in the last example. The, the number of components in a tensor quantity is determined from this formula where, which is given as range exponent order. So the order is the number of free indices in a tensor quantity. When you say free indices, this means which are unrepeated or which are not repeated. A repeated index is not counted in determining the order of a tensor. So, so for example, sigma ij has a range of 3 and the order is, since it has two indices, so it will have an order of 2. So 3 exponent 2 or 3 raised to power 2 would mean 3 times 3, which is equals to 9. And that's why a uh, rank 2 tensor has two indices, will have 9 components. Okay, so now you understand what tensors are and what are the tensor notations which we are going to use in this course. Now let's move to the next part where we're going to discuss about the stress invariants. Consider a stress state sigma ij defined relative to a particular rectangular Cartesian coordinate system OXI and I in this case varies from 1 to 3 so we have axes as X1, X2 and X3. Based on this rectangular Cartesian coordinate system if we take an infinitesimal material element as you see on the screen then our stress tensor can be defined as these nine components so this way you can define the stress state. So you will have nine components. The direct components will always be related to the axis coordinate which you are using. So sigma 2, 2 is the force in two direction and the area of this surface in two direction as I explained in the previous part. So this way we will have three direct components and similarly three shear components if it's a symmetric stress tensor. If it's not symmetric, in that case we will have six shear components. So if I want to write it down in the matrix form, so the second order stress tensor sigma ij, where i and j both varies from 1 to 3, based on the rectangular coordinate system, can be given as this, where sigma 1 1, sigma 1 2, sigma 1 3 are coming from this plane, then similarly for the, from the other planes we have the other three components. And this way we have in total nine stress components which, are, which define a second order stress tensor. Now if you look at the magnitude of the components in each individual component of the second order stress tensor, then it will depend on 
various factors depends on the geometry it also depends on the applied loading how the loading is being applied on this structure also the location of this infinitesimal material element where you have taken this small cube of material from and also the orientation of the coordinate system orientation of the coordinate system is very important thing and changing the orientation of the coordinate system changes everything and that's what i'm going to explain in the next few slides so let's say rectangular cartesian coordinate system as x o x1 o x2 and o x3 if i rotate this cartesian coordinate to o i o x i double prime in this case the new x1 axis will be x1 double prime x2 double prime and x3 double prime respectively for x1 x2 and x3 axis so now if you look at the stress tensor which was based on the previous Cartesian coordinate system everything has been now rotated so your material element has been rotated and this means you have newer double prime components of stresses as you see here which may be different than what you have in the actual coordinate system so if you want to obtain these new components of stresses in the new coordinate system then you can obtain it based on the values from the old coordinate system and the angle of rotations which your coordinate system has been rotated for. How you can do it? You can use this kind of trans transformation matrix which transforms one coordinate system into another coordinate system based on the direction cosines and what you do is basically you find the angles between the individual axes and then you try to find out the direction cosines and that will give you the rotation or transformation tensor which is a second order tensor again and that you can use to find out the updated stress values in the new coordinate system what you have to do is you have to multiply the actual stress tensor which is in the actual rectangular coordinate rectangular Cartesian coordinate system with these transformation matrices as shown here and that will give you the updated stress tensor in the new coordinate system so AIG I already explained to you is a transformation tensor and whose components are the cosines of the angles between the old and the new coordinate axis this is just an explanation of that so you can read through it and it's based on the summation rule so i hope you are familiar with how the matrices are multiplied so in this case we have a three by three matrix three by three matrix and three by three matrix so, or in tensor terms it's a second or all of them are the second order tensor you're gonna get nine components in each tensor okay so now you understand that the components of the stress at a point depends on the orientation of the coordinate axis and you need to use that to define the stress state so remember the components of a stress at a point depend on the orientation of the coordinate axis used to define the stress state and the maximum direct stresses for all possible orientation of the coordinate axis are generally called principal so what you are trying to do you are trying to find a stress definition which is independent of the orientation of the coordinate system and that's called principal stresses in in solid mechanics so what you do you uh, what you do is using the concept of equilibrium of forces on material element we can easily find out the relationship for principal stresses from the equations which are given here so we apply the force balance in that material point and we will end up with this kind of determinant which is equal to zero so all the forces in static equilibrium should be equal to zero it's based on that so again i'm not giving you the whole derivation of it you can look at any solid mechanics book how they reach to this determinant value now if you want to solve this you need to really see that you you have three of those sigma unknown values and this means you will have three simple principal stresses because once you expand this determinant you will have a cubic equation so in a 3d stress state we can say that we will have always three principal stresses 
So as I told you, this gives a cubic equation in the principal stress. And after expansion, you will get an equation which would look something like this. Where I1, I2 and I3, I have denoted as sigma kk. Then I2 is minus half sigma ij, sigma ji minus sigma ii, sigma jj. If you remember from the first part of this course, sigma kk means repeated index. So you need to add all the values from 1 to 3. So it will be I1 will be sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 and sigma 3, 3. Similarly, you have to calculate, in order to calculate this, you need to vary both i and j from 1 to 3. So there could be many different combinations and you have to consider all those combinations. And i3 is the determinant of sigma ij, which is given as this value here. So these are generally termed as stress invariants. So for a 3D stress state, you can have three different stress invariants and their values are independent of the orientation of the coordinate system. So whatever coordinate system you are using and how much you are rotating your coordinate system, these stress invariants never change. Which, and when I say invariant, these are these I1, I2 and I3. So these values will never change. Thus, the roots of this equation, which will be the principal stresses in the cubic, if you solve this cubic equation, the magnitude of principal stresses will always be independent of the orientation of the coordinate system because the roots of this equation will depend on these three invariants and they are always independent of the orientation of the coordinate system. And hence, we say that principal stresses are independent of the orientation of the coordinate system. So I hope it is clear what principal st stresses really mean. And you, you see a lot of times in post-processing FE results, you come across principal stresses as well. Now let's consider again a stress state sigma ij. And again, it is defined to a particular rectangular coordinate system OXI as I showed you before. The stress state will in general result in a deformation which is made up of two parts. So when you are starting deforming your material point or your material, then the stress state will cause two types of deformation. One is called the volume change and the other one is called the shape change. So one will try to change the increase or decrease the volume of the object and another one will try to distort it, right, the shape of the object. So this, this brings us to the two new quantities in stress analysis. One is called the hydrostatic stress and the other one is called the deviatoric stress. So whichever components of the stresses are involved in changing the volume of the material during deformation, then that those component that component is called hydrostatic stress, and the one which is associated with the change in the shape of the object or material point is called the deviatoric stress. So in general, the stress tensor is given by the sum of hydrostatic stress, which is sigma kk over 3. Because generally hydrostatic stress is when you are applying stresses or forces in all directions, like a hydrostatic pressure. A cube, for example, inside a fluid is under the hydrostatic stress. And that is basically all about pressure. So in this case, it will be the sigma kk over 3 plus the deviatoric part of the stress, which will try to shape, change the shape of the component. Now, what, what are these two quantities? So sigma kk, as you remember, repeated indices. So you always have to add the same indices together. So it will be sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3, as I explained before. And if you remember, sigma ij will have nine components, while the delta ij here is given as, is basically the identity tensor if you're more familiar with matrices. So you only have one in the diagonal, rest of the components are zero. Or it's, it's also termed as Kronecker delta in continuum mechanics, which means if i is equal to j, then it's equal to one. And if i is not equal to j, it's equal to zero. So for example, delta one, one will be one, delta one, 2 where i is not equal to j will be 0 and so on. So it is in a way the definition of the identity matrix or tensor.
and that is what's written here as well okay so i hope this is clear now how to compute the hydrostatic stress i stress tensor is comprised comprised of two stress components one is called the hydrostatic stress and the other one is called the deviatoric stress hydrostatic stress changes the volume and deviatoric stress changes the shape or distorts the shape of the Okay, now if you want to look at that components of deviatoric stress, so since we already know or we can measure the actual stress state, so we know the stress tensor, we can easily compute the hydrostatic stress based on this definition, right? Because sigma kk will be sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3 over 3 times this identity matrix. So that will be then subtracted from this actual stress tensor and then we can get the deviatoric stress tensor which will be changing the shape of the object so if you want to write this down in the matrix form then it basically is the deviatoric stress will be sigma 1 1 minus this half of this sigma 1 2 sigma 1 3 will remain the same because delta ij will be zero so this whole term gets zero in the off diagonal matrix and then the diagonals you will get this kind of values so deviatoric stress is a measure of the level of shear stress so it's when you are trying to distort it it's mostly shear effect right and you will shortly see that this deviatoric stress is the stress which dictates the onset of the plastic deformation so and that will then give us kind of a yield criteria for which is more relevant to this course and in order to do that again uh, we need to find out what are the invariants of the deviatoric stress because again deviatoric stress is taken directly from the actual stress so it may be the case that by changing the orientation of the coordinate system it will change so we need to look for the invariants of this stress tensor which is a deviatoric stress tensor and that will basically make us independent of the coordinate system as we did it for the principal stresses so we do the same exercise here so, in, so we find, try to find out the invariance of the deviatoric stress and again we solve that matrix equal to zero as we did it for the actual equilibrium and in this case we end up with three invariants for David from deviatoric stress and this time we call them j1 j2 and j3 so j1 is very similar to what we had previously which was sigma kk in this case it's sigma kk prime because it's the deviatoric component of the stress tensor Similarly, J2 is given by this and this is again very similar relationship as I explained to you in the previous slide here. Uh, where when I give you the principal stress relationship, uh, which is here. So you see this is very, these are very similar, but only thing is the prime, which means J1, J2 and J3 in the next slide are basically coming from the deviatoric stress tensor, not the actual stress tensor. And deviatoric stress tensor we have computed using the actual stress tensor minus the hydrostatic stress tensor. So these are these things and now the onset of the plastic deformation in ductile material depends on the magnitude of the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor. First invariant, if you if you had already paid attention to what I have been saying, is again the repeated indices. So sigma 1 1 prime plus sigma 2 2 prime plus sigma 3 3 prime. So it's a hydrostatic part, kind of hydrostatic part of the deviatoric stress. But deviatoric stress is already without any volumetric part because we subtracted from the total stress the volumetric part. So this one will not have any volumetric part. So if we have done all the calculations correct, then this J1 will always come out to be zero, right? Because there is no volumetric part into it. So the only thing which is more critical in this case is J2. And this is the one which is used or which is found to cause plastic deformation in ductile materials. And it depends on the magnitude of that. Again, I am not giving you the derivation, but this is the one which we're going to see later on is used in the, or many of the yield criterions or predicting the onset of plastic deformation.
Okay, let's move to the next part where we will see how does the phone music scale criteria really looks like. And then I will give you one of the definitions of elastic and plastic response in the tell materials based on phone music yield criteria. And then in the next part, we will start working on implementing that theory. Again, I will keep the derivations to minimum and I will try to give you more details on our final outcomes and assumptions. If you are more interested in derivations, then you can look at any basic solid mechanics in a stress analysis book. Okay, so when you talk about yield criteria, you use it to predict the onset of plastic yielding under the complex stress state. So you can have a very complex 3D stress state. You want to predict the yielding or plast onset of plastic yielding, then you need an yield criterion. Once the plastic deformation has started, you can have strain hardening in the material due to the dislocation motion and the interaction of different dislocations. So there are different types of strengthening mechanisms. And for that, you need hardening laws. So that will be the second part of this course. To determine the plast components of plastic strain, you need to define a flow rule, which defines how your material is going to flow or deform during the plastic deformation. So for that, we need a flow rule. So again, I will define that in the next few slides. So for this course and for phone music criterion, we are assuming everything to be isotropic. This means if we change the orientation of the material, the properties don't change. Also, we are assuming that material is elastic plastic and it will be in the first case with no hardening and in the second case it will have isotropic hardening. So if you talk about plastic yielding, different theories available and the most widely accepted theory is the maximum distortional energy theory. And it says that when, when the maximum distortional energy equals the distortional energy at yield in a uniaxial test, the material will have plastic yielding. Based on this energy definitions, we end up with this kind of criterion which says that when the equivalent stress uh, which is given by a square root of 3 times J2 and J2 is the second invariant of the debitoric is less than or equal to sigma Y. So what is J2? J2 as I told you is the second invariant of the debitoric stress and in terms of principal stresses it is given by this relationship here where sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 are principal stresses which are independent of the coordinate system. I gave you the definition of that in previous part. Or in terms of deviatoric stress tensor, it is given by this relationship where sigma i i prime will be zero. So you end up with half of sigma i j prime times sigma i j prime. And if you want to compute sigma i j prime, then that is basically computed based on the total stress tensor is given as sigma ij minus the hydrostatic part because we believe that the deviatoric part is the only one which is trying to change the shape of the material or distorting the material and that's why maximum distortional energy comes into play here so this definition is called the j2 plasticity theory or j2 plasticity criteria or fold mises yield criterion so there are many different names in the literature on that most widely used name is phone mises plasticity or phone mises yield criterion so now if you want to define the phone mises plasticity theory, firstly you need to define the elasticity. I'm going to use for elasticity, generally people use the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio as elastic constants, but I'm going to use in the basic solid mechanics uh, or stress analysis, we prefer to use Lamy's constants, lambda and mu. So I'm going to use that and based on that, 3D stress state can be given by this equation where Sigma ij is equal to the last Lamy's constants times the strain tensor. And it's the same as uh, uh, Young's modulus times the epsilon value in 1D. So this is given by this. So sigma ij is Lamy's constant lambda times delta ij times epsilon kk. So this is the volumetric part. Plus this is more sort of a 2 mu times epsilon ij elastic. So everything is elastic in this case. And that's why a strain tensor is given as elastic in the superscript. Abacus also uses this, this definition, so that's why I'm going with this definition here. If you want to define the stress rates or stresses in Abacus, then Abacus generally uses Yeoman or co-rotational rate form for solid elements, while green nakhti rate for shells, membranes, beams, and trusses. So you have to make sure that if you are implementing the UMAT for solid elements, 
or for shell membrane beam or truss elements you need to use the appropriate stress rate definition so in this case we are going to do it for solid elements so we're going to work with yaw minus stress rate so above equation in the yaw minus stress rate can be given by this where hip j is basically used for yaw minus rate and now you can see it's in, in time derivative terms so sigma dot ij equals to lambda delta ij times epsilon dot kk elastic and then plus 2 mu times epsilon ij dot as well everything has is in elastic zone so if you want to find out the increment of stresses we need to integrate this so once when we integrate with respect to time then in the co-rotational frame where the integrated form is generally given as this equation here again i'm giving you the final relationship you can look at the derivation in any any textbook so delta sigma ij which is the increment of stress tensor is given as given in terms of the Lamy's constants and the increments of the stress tensor and volumetric and total elastic strain tensor form. So this way you can define the Yaman rate in incremental form. Now if you move towards the next part which is the plasticity, so we need to first define the yield function and either as we discussed the yield function is based on the maximum distortional energy theory. And this gives us the von Mises yield criterion, which is given here that equivalent stress should be less than or equal to sigma y, right? Uh, for non hardening materials. And sigma and sigma equivalent is generally given as the square root of 3 times the J2, where J2 is the second invariant of a stress tensor. And is given by this equation here. And if you want to compute sigma ij prime, which is the debatoric stress tensor, then you can compute it with the actual stress tensor. In addition to that, we need to also define the equivalent plastic strain because we need to keep track of the permanent deformation in the material due to the plastic deformation. And that is based on the equivalent plastic strain. And for that, you need to find out the increments of the equivalent plastic strain, which is given here with respect to time. And you have to integrate it over the total time to get the accumulated plastic, equivalent plastic strain in the material. If you want to find out the epsilon dot plastic, which is a time increment of plastic strain, equivalent plastic strain with respect to time, then it's given by the square root of 2 by 3 epsilon ij plastic dot times epsilon ij plastic dot. This is a plastic strain tensor rate, right? And now we need to define this, this uh, evolu the evolution of this strain, plastic strain tensor. So that we can compute the total equivalent plastic strain in the material due to the plastic deformation. So to, to define this, we need another law, and that's called the flow rule. So the flow rule is based on the normality rule, and in this case, you can define or in the von Mises plasticity theory the and the plastic strain tensor evolution equation is given by this relationship here. So it's a function of 3 by 2 times the derivative stress tensor over the yield strength times the evolution of the total plastic strain tensor, equivalent plastic strain. So this comes from that equation here from previous step. If you remember here and then here and then so we update that based on this we compute the next one so the phone Mises yield surface if you look on if you want to look at the phone Mises yield surface based on these equations flow rule and also the stress definition then it in the 2d stress space in terms of sigma 1 and sigma 2 as the principal stresses it looks like an ellipse as shown here so anything inside this ellipse means elastic anything is at the border or outside the border is basically plastic deformation so this is called the yield surface in 2d stress space the equation is given as this which is again based on the simplification of the that equation which we had in the previous case so in most of the cases when you are implementing the phone Mises plasticity we normally work with a normality rule and normality rule works in such a way that if we apply a strain value and we predict we try to calculate the trial stress value if it is somewhere inside this limit then we compare it with the 
yield strength and if it is below this then this means it's, we are still inside the yield surface so everything is, is still elastic so you don't need to compute any of the plastic deformations but if you are applying any deformation and you find out that your tried stress is outside this yield surface this means you basically are in the plastic zone so if you have no hardening so you have to return it back to the yield surface and generally to returning to the yield back yield surface is done through normality rule which means you will always return in the direction and you will or you will intersect the yield surface in such a way that you're always normal in that direction so that's called the normality rule and that's why bone basis plasticity theory is also called the associated plasticity theory because you always follow this normality rule any deformation you are outside you go follow the normality rule you draw a normal from that point to on the on this yield criteria and wherever you intersect you basically are at that point and then based on that you can update the plastic strains tensors and then also the elastic and total strength tensors as well so this way it works if you look if you look at it from if you move from 2d to 3d stress space then this ellipse basically changes into a cylinder as you see here it becomes more complicated but again anything which is inside this cylinder is elastic and anything outside of this cylinder is plastic so then you have to update all this plastic strains as well and also you have to use a normality rule so if you go out then you always have to return normal to the yield surface and bring it back to the yield surface because your trial value is higher than that so again i will explain this when you when we will implement it that how this is implemented in the numerical code Okay, let's look into the numerical implementation of phone mesis plasticity with no hardening. By the end of part 4, now you will have a clear idea about different types of tensors, phone mesis plasticity, what sort of criteria is there when we talk about phone mesis plasticity which is based on the equivalent stress criteria and we assume that the deviatoric part of the stress tensor is the one which tries to distort or change the shape of the material and is the main cause of plastic deformation in conventional metals. So numerical implementation is very straightforward case of initial yielding. So if I can use, let's use the right one. So if I try to explain the numerical implementation of plasticity for an ideally plastic material, let's look at sigma and epsilon plot. When we start deformation in uniaxial case, we always go to start with the elastic limit, and then once we reach to the yield strength of the material or the strength of the material, we can call it sigma f as well. Then we will have plastic deformation. For ideally plastic material, we will have horizontal line. For strain hardening material, we will have some kind of hardening behavior, which will be the next part of this course. So how this numerical implementation works is for for every strain increment which is the input comes from the finite element solver for example abacus if we get an increment of a strain delta epsilon and also tell total strain then based on this increment we can as we can calculate the value current value of the stress and in uni exit context if let's say if our delta epsilon reaches or based on this strain increment the stress reaches to this value here then we can compare this value with the yield strength and we can see in this diagram as well that this is lower than this value so we are still in the elastic zone so our trial value coming for a stress based on the last linear elastic solution says that we are still in the elastic zone so what you will do you don't need to compute any plastic strains and you can just update the stress and move to the next increment however if our strain increments were such that our trial stress value goes out of the or above the yield strength then in that case we need to use return scheme so for that increment of plus strain you need to come back to the yield surface and that's called the uh, uh, so your trial value was here so you're predicting the elastic that's called the elastic predictor step and if it is higher than this then you will use the character step and in that case you will bring it down 
bring back to the yield surface of the material which is this in this case and this will this strain will contribute towards the plastic strain in the material and for uniaxial case this will be equivalent to the equivalent plastic strain increments and this way it continues then you go further and then it keeps on returning back if you are in the plastic zone and this way you track or you trace this whole curve of the stress strain curve in the real life so this is how the uh, return mapping scheme really works in the context of yield surface which is a phone mesial yield criterion if I plot it in terms of principal stress as sigma 1 and sigma 2 in 2D, then as I told you before, it looks something like an ellipse. And these values here are the yield strength of the material, which is sigma y. So this is negative sigma y, this is positive sigma y, this is positive yield strength, and this is negative yield strength. So based on the direction, let's say if you go up to this, we compare that we are inside the yield criterion based on the yield criteria I gave you in the last part. We are in the elastic zone. We update the stress. Move on. If we, if our prediction shows that we are above this yield surface, this means we need to now use some kind of correction step. And in that case, uh, we will use a normality rule based on the flow rule, and we will come normal to the surface back here. And this will give us the increment of equivalent plastic strain, and that will be then stored as an accumulated plastic strain in the material. So this is the overall analogy graphically. So as I said, we will be using return mapping algorithm. I tried to explain to you in 1D and also in 2D cases. Similarly, in 3D, you will have a cylindrical shape for phone mesis criteria and you will again use the same analogy. So as soon as you are out of the yield surface, you basically have to use radial mapping or return mapping scheme to go back to the yield surface. In all these cases, as we have no hardening, so our yield surface is constant. But in the next part, when we will have isotropic hardening, in that case, our yield surface will start to grow. And then we have to really capture that as well or keep into account that as well while we are doing return mapping algorithm. So first thing is we will compute the trial stress value based on the purely linear elastic response. And that's called the elastic predictor step. So again, in this case, I'm using Lamy's constant mu and lambda. If you have Young's model as E and Poisson's ratio nu, you can use standard elastic relationship to find these values and vice versa as well. So based on the elastic solution, our stress increment will always be a function of the volumetric part of the elastic strain and the total strain as well, which is more on the shear part, which is trying to change the shape of the material. So this is, this is what you are after. And remember the elastic strains are generally total strains minus the plastic strain tensor. So total strain comes from the Abacus finite element software. Elastic strains we need to compute to update the stresses. And to compute the elastic strains, we need to find out what are the plastic strains if we are in the plastic zone. In order to define the stiffness tensor, so we need to uh, use of define you use a fourth order tensor because uh, the elastic stiffness tensor is a fourth order tensor so you will have a six by six matrix and for isotropic linear isotropic material with two elastic constants in this case lam is constant mu and nu it's given by this so again you can have a look at any linear elastic theory okay so now we know that and what we do now we try to compute the trial value of a stress tensor based on the strain increment as i told you before coming from the finite element software we already know this for from our linear elastic solution which i gave in the previous slide this is the previous stress tensor which is coming from the previous time increment so everything is solved incrementally in this case so once uh, here everything is cauchy stress tensor in this case and we are trying to find out the trial stress value as i said which is a predictor value because we are not sure if it's in the elastic zone or a plastic zone. And then we will update it based on the using the previous step value as well. Now we will determine the trial yield function. And for that, we need to compute the equivalent stress. So I gave you the relationship for equivalent stress, and this is given by 3 over 2 deviatoric part of stress tensor times deviatoric part of stress tensor. So it will give you one scalar value since this is a double inner product in continuum mechanics. So again, if you're not, if you haven't done any tensor algebra course, so you just have to believe me that when you multiply these two things, it's like a dot product in vector as well. 
they will be kind so double inner products will give you a scalar value here so you will get one single number as equivalent stress for trial and in terms of expansion after you expand it in terms of com individual components you can write it down in this form as well so if you are really confused with this tensor notation you can directly use this relationship if you know all the components of your stress tensor to calculate the equivalent stress which, which is basically coming from the trial state once we have done the equivalent stress this is a scalar number we will subtract it from the yield strength and if it is less than zero then as i explained before we are in the based on this we are in the elastic zone somewhere so we need to we don't need to do anything we just update stresses and that will be our solution so we update the trial stress to be the equivalent to stress and also the trial sigma ij to the actual stress tensor and then we go to the next increment if this comes out to be greater than zero right this means our stress is higher than the equivalent yield strength value so we need to use this return mapping scheme in this case we call it radial return because we we say in the hydrostatic state 3d stress state it looks like a circle okay so in this case we need to use some kind of normality rule as i told you so we need to find out the flow direction and also we need to find out what is the effective plastic strain increment in this step and for that we will be using newton method because it's a non-linear equation which we have to solve in this case we are using dealing with ideal plasticity as i told you before that means a horizontal line after the plastic deformation starts and that's why the tangent moduli of that part of the curve is zero because the slope of that line is zero so to determine the incremental plastic strain we need to solve this equation and if you again go back and look at the own Mises plasticity theory where if you are really interested in the whole derivation then this is kind of the correct step so what is happening if our trial stress is higher than the yield strength value then we need to bring it down to the yield function or to the yield strength value and this plastic strain contribution basically does that so if we subtract this contribution which is the deviatory part coming from the stress strain relationship then it will basically does the job of this in return mapping algorithm so i have tried to simplify it down without confusing you with the overall derivation you can have a look at many other books and videos where they explain how you come to this relationship here so the only thing unknown now for us in this case is this increment of equivalent plastic strain right so we have to solve for this And that's what we are doing now so we need to use newton method because in majority of the cases we end up with a non-linear solution where we cannot separate the variables so to find the solution for delta epsilon p we need to use an iterative process so for any iteration i we need to solve make this residual to be minimum or zero right and for that we use newton method if you are not familiar with Newton's method to get a new value in this case it's delta epsilon p we are after but if we are our unknown is x so for an updated value of x n plus one we will use the previous value of x n that the, the function at x n which is this in this case and then the derivative of the same function with respect to the variable we are after which is this delta epsilon p so i'm going to now substitute these values here and you can see that this one is the updated value this is from the previous value plastic equivalent plastic stream increment this is the residual which is coming from this function here and then this is the derivative of this whole thing with respect to the epsilon p and that's the increment of the equivalent plastic strain so this way we we can find the updated value of equivalent plastic strain in this case the stress f is sigma y because we are dealing with ideal plastic material and also the slope of the line after the plasticity is zero because we have no hardening in the material later on you will see that these are not this value is not zero and this also is not constant because it changes yield strength changes as the as we start to deform the material so we will accommodate that and this needs to be updated as well 
in numerical implementation which i will show you later on so this whole scheme basically concludes when our r becomes zero for different values of epsilon p once the value of the delta epsilon p has been determined which is the increment of the equivalent plastic strain we can use a normality condition which i explained before graphically and we can determine the stresses based on this formula which is a function of the derivative part of the trial stress equivalent trial stress yield strength value chronic delta and the volumetric part of the trial stress well, okay and this is just a typical definition based on the trial stress we will we are finding the updated values of the stresses we can also find out the elastic strains and also the plastic strain tensor which is again given here based on the newton method which i explained before so so this way you have updated the stresses and also the elastic and plastic strain tensors once we have done that then the most important part is to find out the consistent material jacobian which really then contributes towards the global stiffness matrix of the finite element solver because that data this data also goes back to the finite element solver in order to find the consistent material jacobian we you need to take a partial derivative of the stress tensor increment with refer with respect to strain tensor increment and this is the relationship for for the stress increment rate if i substitute everything in the initial stress increment based on all the values and formulas which i have given you in the previous slides so you can have a go at it and see if you can reach to that otherwise you can look at any textbook and you can find a standard relationship there as well also remember for very large strain version an additional initial step should be introduced by rotating the stresses elastic strains and plastic strain tensors according to hughes and winget algorithm and for that we don't need to do anything in abacus because abacus already has a subroutine which we can directly call and this is called rot sig so i'm going to use the same so i'm not going to go into the details of what to do what is really the happening at the background when you have a large strain version because in the last strain version we work with the deformation gradients and not with the strain increment so okay let's look at the coding for phone mesh plasticity with uh, no hardening and obviously we are targeting the user material subroutine in abacus ce so when you talk about user material subroutine the term umat is used and umat is generally coming from u from the user and mat from the material because user material subroutines are written in fortran language so we're going to be covering that today but before jumping into the implementation and coding of the phone mesh plasticity theory i would first introduce you with the umat subroutine if you haven't used it before so what i will cover is what is a umat subroutine how to get started with using or writing a user material subroutine and the structure of the user material subroutine and also the relevant variables which are involved to explain better the concept of user material subroutine we will consider an abacus static analysis step imagine you have a rod which is made up of some linear elastic material young's modulus and poisson's ratio as the properties it is fixed from one end and you are pulling the sample from the other direction so it's kind of a uniaxial test so in terms of boundary conditions we have u equals to 0 at this end and we have a boundary condition u on the other side so it's a static problem and we are trying to solve this so when we define these properties which is linear elastic properties the geometry and the boundary condition in abacus software then it will first start with an increment and to start an increment it will find out okay let's start with a certain initial increment time which again you specify in your step definition and then it will do a global iteration and try to find out what will be the relevant strain increment for that time increment which was prescribed in the step definition it will then call the material model with the definition of the strain increment tensor and that material model will calculate the stresses and the jacobian matrix 
Remember the Jacobian matrix was that partial derivative of a stress increment with respect to the strain increment tensor. Then it will solve the balance equations. All these stresses and Jacobian will be passed on from the material model to the global, again global abacus solver. We will solve for balance equation. In this case, the balance equation for a static case would be equilibrium equation for static equilibrium, sum of all the forces, etc., equal to zero. And then it will check for convergence. So if it finds the equilibrium for the whole global model is satisfied, then it will update the stresses and everything and it will go back and start a new increment. And this way your simulation will progress to the next increment until it ends at the total displacement which is defined as the boundary condition. If it doesn't converge, which means it's a no to this, then it will again go to the global iterative solver and it will reduce the time increment and then it will come back with a smaller strain increment tensor and then repeat the same process until it gets the convergence. So this is how it works. Now if imagine if the default material model is, is not useful for us and we want to write our own user material subroutine, then we basically bypass this whole step here. And rather we write a UMIT subroutine where again the global solver calls the user material subroutine with the material properties current increment of a strain which it was doing before also the current strain which is a total strain at that time increment previous stress tensor which is coming from the previous time increment and also any state dependent variables which could be plastic strains or any other variables which you are storing and which are getting updated during every increment so again it will cal calculate the current stress and jacobian again jacobian definition i have already defined before here I have again written it down and then it will again solve for balance and if it converges updates the stresses and everything and goes to the next increment if no then again go back and come back with a smaller time increment so this is the whole cycle now if you look at the UMAT subroutine this is the main block of the user material subroutine in Abacus and you can see subroutine UMAT is called with a number of variables this is the file which is kind of a library file you always have to include that and then some definition initialization or definition of different variables that what type of variables are these and then this is the part where you write your code followed by a return and end so at every integration point in your model for each element this subroutine will be called and, and you, your job is basically to compute all these things which are given here in the board so you must compute or calculate these variables. So the first one is the stress tensor. Second one is the state variables, which could be plastic strains, etc. In the context of phone Mises plasticity. And then the Jacobian, which is the partial derivative of the stress increment tensor with respect to the strain increment tensor. Also, if you are interested, then you can also compute different types of energies like total strain energy, plastic dissipation energy, contact dissipation energy, and so on. Also, if it's a thermomechanical analysis, then you have to compute the Jacobian with respect to the temperatures, as well as other things. So again, if you are interested, you can have a look at this. For the current problem, these are irrelevant for us. There are some other variables which are mentioned here. So this is the total strain at that time increment, current time increment. D strand is the strain increment tensor for the current time increment again time is an array of two variables time one is the st current step time and time two is the total step time so if you have multiple steps then time two basically will give you the sum of all the times in all the all the steps prior to this current increment d time is the time increment temperature is temperature value total temperature value and d temp is the temperature increment for this increment of time and so on. Similarly, in addition to that, some variables are passed through Abacus input file. So, for example, n props defines the number of properties which will be coming from Abacus input file. And props, depending on the n props, prop size will depend, decide how many variables are coming as material constants. So, for example, if you are using this kind of material card for elastic material where you define the Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio then you have two n props 
So n props will be equal to 2 and then props 1 will be the first property and props 2 will be the Poisson's ratio in that case. Also depending on the state variables which you are using. So let's say if you are using, if you are, if you are only storing the equivalent plastic strain which is a scalar value then you only need one depth variable uh, which is the solution dependent variable. If you are storing let's say six elastic strains, six plastic strains and one equivalent plastic strain then, then this means you need a value of 13 here and then the rest of the stuff arrays will automatically be arranged. There are some other variables here as well for example number of element for which element it's been called which integration point it's been called. So I hope this makes sense how it works. If you are defining the model you need to make sure that you understand how Abacus stores stresses and strain tensors because if you remember from our previous set parts in this course the stress tensor can have 3 by 3 matrix so it's a second order tensor this means it will have nine components similarly the strain will also have nine components but Abacus uses a symmetric definition which means the off diagonal terms which are the shear stress values are the same so your matrix tensor in the matrix form is symmetric so in that case you define you only need six component of stresses where stress one is sigma one one stress two is sigma two two stress three stress three is sigma three three and then so on and so stress six will be sigma two three again if you are confused with one one two two direction so one is x direction two is y direction and three is that direction so sigma one one will be sigma xx in a, in contrast to any stress analysis definition and sigma two three will be sigma yx which is a shear component of stress in yx plane similarly so this means n tens which is which describes the size of the array of a stress stress or a strain tensor or vector is six or 3d elements and this means there will be three direct components 1 1 2 2 and 3 3 and then three shear components and that's why you have 3 plus 3 equals to 6 so for all the 3d elements in the u mat this n tense variable will be 6 which means three of direct component and three of shear components for plain strain cases or axisymmetric elements this will be 4 because you still have stresses for example, for plane strain case, your strain is zero in thickness direction, but you still have stress in the fourth direction, and that's why you have four components of stresses. So again, I would suggest if you are working with some other elements than 3D, then please have a look at the Abacus documentation to find out based on your element formulation what array size for stresses and strain should be used, or Abacus will be calling the UMET for. Okay, so now getting back to the coding, I hope you understand what Abacus UMAT really is. So I have just copied here the template of the UMAT which you can copy in a text file or if you have an Intel Fortran compiler editor then you can use that uh, and you can copy paste this template from the whatever version you have in your computer for Abacus. So make sure you, you are copying the same compatible version because previous versions of Abacus had slightly different nomenclature as compared to the recent versions. So this is how it is and as I explained before this is the area where we're going to type the code. Okay so the first thing is we need to initialize the variables and in our case we have to define the variables such as elastic strain tensor, elastic strain tensor, the flow tensor which tells us the direction of the flow, old stress tensor which is coming from the previous step and also old plastic strain tensor which is again from the previous increment so we need to update all these things and for that we need to also initialize them at the in, in UMAT so that it knows what these variables really mean so that's what I have done here E elastic is the elastic strain tensor and tense is coming from Abacus so for 3D case it will be 6 this is the plastic strain tensor with 6 components this is the flow stress coming from with 6 components these are the old stress and plastic strain components again with six components in 3D context. We will also define since we are going to use the Newton method for that residual which I explained in the previous part. So I am defining that 
parameters related to Newton iteration. So tolerance is one exponent minus six, which is a very small number. And we also need to find out how many number of iterations we can use in the UMAD. And we are giving a maximum value of 20 so that we can get a convergence. Now we need, to, we need to also initialize the Jacobian to be zero. If you remember, Jacobian will have, be a fourth order tensor. So it will be a six by six matrix and we need to assign those to zero and also assign the material properties from coming from the input file to corresponding variables so that we can use it in Abacus. When it comes into the UMAT, it's only called prop one, prop two, etc. So firstly, so that's what I have done. I have defined all the DDS, DE as zeros. Then I have three constants in Abacus file because we are working with phone Mises theory with no hardening. So we need Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, and yield stress. So these are the three variables we will be defining in the Abacus CAE or Abacus input file. And then based on our constant definition, if we say constant equals to three and n prop equal to three, this means prop one will be the first variable, Young's modulus, prop two will be the second variable, Poisson's ratio, and prop three will be the yield strength. If we have hardening, then we will need more props. And I will show you later on if we need those in the in the universal routine or not. So as I told you, if we are working with finite deformation in cases, then we need to use the finite deformation formula formulation and Abacus has this rod sick subroutine which can rotate the elastic and plastic strains in the forward direction. So that is what's been done here. So we call rod sick which transforms the state variables in the elastic and plastic zone in the and rotates it forward. Similarly for equivalent plastic strain, I am also using a state variable which is one plus two times six right and tens is six for 3d so six times two is 12 plus one is 13. so equivalent plastic strain will always be state variable 13 while state variable one to six will be elastic strain and state variable six seven to twelve would be the plastic strain tensor and now what we do we basically can also assign the previous stress and equivalent plastic strain to old and old plastic variable and that's what I have done here. So this stress, which we have to update here in the UMAT, the value it has currently is from the previous increment. So we're going to store it as old as. And similarly, equivalent plastic strain is stored as old plastic in this case. Now we go to the elastic projector step and we need to first build the elastic stiffness matrix. So we are working currently with uh, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. So we need to find out the Lamy's constant. So, so this is the lambda and this is the mu value. And these are the standard last formulas. You can find it in any linear elasticity theory book. And if you remember, the fourth order tensor looked something like this, where two lambda, where diagonal terms were two lambda plus two mu plus lambda for first three columns. And then it was mu. So that's what I have done here. So I have just assigned these values. So for example, and i is one, this means this is one. So one, one, two, one, and three, one is assigned as this one. And then similarly, I assign for diagonal terms, two mu plus lambda. So that's what is done two times mu plus lambda. And that's the diagonal term here. And then I further assign from four to six, which is this as only mu, which is there. So again, you can have a look at that and see, work it out how I have done it here, but it's just, transforming this into the programming language format in do loops in the form of do loops okay next we calculate the predicted stress and elastic strain so if you remember the predicted stress or trial stress was a previous stress tensor plus the elasticity tensor times the increment of strain which is again coming from abacus solver so that is what is been done here we stress is the previous stress value and then we are just multiplying it. This is a multiplication function, which is again, you can use as a library function, which is this D S D D E, which is C, this is, which is a stiffness tensor or Jacobian times the strain increment. And then you add this increment of stresses into this and that becomes your trial value. Similarly, elastic 
strain is basically elastic from previous step plus the current increment of strain so that's a total elastic strain now we calculate the equivalent phone mesis stress because we have a stress tensor now and we can use this relationship which i gave you in the previous part for the equivalent stress again all the values are trial because we are not sure if it's a elastic or plastic region because we are, we are still in the elastic predictive step so i use the same analogy and if i compute the asmesis here firstly I, I firstly i compute through the direct components and then i use the next part here in the do in the form of do loop to include the shear component of the stresses and this, this is how i will get a scalar number which is a mesial stress So now we have to get the yield stress, which was a material property, and we stored it as SY at the start. So we store it as SF for the time being. And now we will check if it's in the plastic region or if it's in the elastic region. And if you remember, the condition was this yield function. Say sigma equivalent trial minus sigma y should be greater than zero to be in the yielding zone. So when we check this, we define this condition here so if s mesis which is a trial stress is greater than the sum tolerance value times a yield strength of the material in this case then we need to calculate the flow direction we need to get see how far we are or out of that before we can apply the return mapping scheme if you remember and that flow direction was given by the deviatoric trial stress over the equivalent trial stress so that's what i have done here i compute the hydrostatic part of the stress here i subtract the hydrostatic part from the total stress tensor and then i divide with the mesis stress to get the flow direction for all of the six components of the flow direction okay once we have done the flow direction then we have to compute the incremental equivalent plastic strain and if you remember we saw we will we'll use the newton method so that's in this case there is no hardening ideal plastic material so i already explained et is zero later on when isotropic hardening is used and we will use some arbitrary relationship for that but we will come back to that once we will read in the second part okay so to compute the d equivalent we need to use this residual which i again explained in the last part which is a function of equivalent trial strain stress which we already know the value from the previous slide 3 mu is we already know the values and we need to compute this value that's we are after sigma y is a material properties and then you based on newton method we will find delta epsilon p which is equivalent plastic strain increment using the previous value making this residual to be zero over three mu and in this case sigma f is sigma y because there is no hardening so that's what i have done here again so from this is a newton iteration we compute the right hand side first which is as mesis minus three times mu times equivalent strain minus sf and then we compute the d equivalent here which is the previous value plus right hand side over three times mu plus et but in this case et is zero so you, you can ignore it for the time being similarly sf is sy and then et is zero because there is no hardening so we will solve it for different values of equivalent plastic strain and we will keep it updating as the loop goes on initially it's zero and then it will keep on increasing until we get to a convergence value where the right hand side is getting smaller and smaller and it's less than the some tolerance value again the tolerance was one exponent minus six if you remember we initialized it in the at the start of the subroutine times s y and if it is the case then it exits if it doesn't exit then it will keep on going and we will reach to the new number of iterations equals to 20 remember newton equals to 20 we have used at the start as a parameter and in that case obviously this means that our plasticity loop has not converged so we need to also warn the user that okay your plasticity loop is not con converged you need to do something about it so for that i will just say that if this thing equals to this this means we it, we have reached to the last iteration we, we have a warning printed on the screen that plasticity loop failed Once we have reached to the convergence, we need to upgrade the stresses and strains. And by strain, I mean the plastic strains and also the elastic strain. Total strains are the same which are coming from the solver. 
So we will first update the stresses based on this definition. I already gave you this again in the previous part. It's a function of yield stress times the flow direction plus the volumetric part, David Turigan volumetric part. And similarly, we can find the strain tensor using this relationship. Again, I have provided you with that. So we are just updating based on the flow direction and the new computed value of this equivalent strain and update it, update the plasticity strain tensor using this relationship. So that's what I have done here. I will compute the stresses. Firstly, for the one to three direction, which are the direct components, and that's flow times the uh, SF, which is a yield stress plus the hydrostatic stress, which we have already computed in the previous slide. Similarly, equivalent plastic strain tensor, uh, plastic strain tensor, and in this case, it's again direct components, which is again using this formula. So you can see it's a straightforward use of variables. Flow is always this direction. Sigma and deviatoric stress tensor trial value over the equivalent trial value, equivalent stress trial value. And similarly, then I do the same for the shear components. And again, the formulas are the same, which are here. So they look very similar in this case. Once I have done that, I can also compute the equivalent plastic strain. In this case, we just I just need to add this increment, which I have found from Newton iteration into the equivalent plastic strain from the previous increment. And this way I have updated the stresses, elastic strains, and also the equivalent plastic strains of six, six, and one. You, if you want, you can compute the plastic strain energy density, SPD, if you remember. And that is just the area under the stress strain curve. And that is what I have done here. So you can, based on the stress definition, you can find out stress times strain over two. The last part, which is a very most complicated part in implementing any humid subroutine, especially for plasticity theory, is the computation of the consistent material Jacobian. Or So as your material model gets complicated, your stress rate and increment of stresses become very complicated. And sometimes, it becomes impossible to solve those equations. So for those cases, there are different numerical schemes which are available, which can be used to numerically estimate these Jacobians rather than accurately calculating it. And if you look at Simo and Hughes textbook, then they give you different, different ways of doing that. In this case, it's straightforward thing. So we have this long relationship. Again, I have just given you the final form of the relationship. If you are interested, you can have a look at any textbook. So this is the stress rate in terms of strain increment rates. And to find the Jacobian, we need to take the derivative of this with, its, with respect to these epsilon j i i k l basically. So if we take this derivative, these things will go away and we will end up with these terms. So that's what I have done here. I have just defined the Jacobian basing based on that. So the first term, if you see, is the mu times s sigma y over s mesis. So these these three terms here is they are at various places. So we I have first calculated that. Then I calculate e over one minus nu, which is which is the k value here because we are working with k right now. And it's very much similar to lambda. You can directly use the value of lambda as well if you already know. Minus two over three, which is this, and then this thing is all EFFG variable which is written here. Similarly, third one is this bracket here and I have computed that here as well after simplification. So, so three times mu which is this times ET which is this because I take the LCM and then take it up over three times mu plus ET which is the denominator then. So I just simplified this relationship here. Minus three times again this whole thing is EFFG. So I first define all these and then I update this DSD, DE. So for example, if you remember, and the first, if it is sigma 1, 1, then the derivative of sigma 1, 1 with respect to 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2 1, 2, 3. So you have to take, you have to write all the indices there. And if you start writing that, it will take a long time. So I haven't written it down, but what you have, you can do is for, for example, for, for the case when you have, the same variables, i, i, which means you are dealing with 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3. And in those cases, you will have this term, 
plus this term because this term will be zero if ij is not equal to i is not equal to j because it's a chronicle delta so so that's why whenever you have one one two two or three three which is this case here you will have two times this whole thing plus this whole term here which is remember this was the k minus two times this term so this is how i define the one one thing and then you can see i have done the other definitions as well for example this is the term which will be having the all these terms plus this term as well in the case when you are dealing with that so in this case we will have this term times flow j and flow i these are the flow terms if you remember in terms of ij and kl it looks a bit confusing but when you start writing in the indices then hopefully you should be able to define that if you are always confused with that then i would suggest to numeric use some kind of numerical technique to estimate jacobian as well which most of the cases people ha have to end up with because this is a very highly researched topic and jacobian is one of the most difficult thing to implement in UMAT, especially if you are dealing with plasticity or very complicated models so i hope i was able to clarify this to reach to this relationship you can look at any plasticity book start writing them in terms of i11 indices from 1 to 6 for each i j k and l and then you will end up with this and then you will see you will understand better how i did that okay so i hope this is clear now now once we have done the jacobians we need to store all the variables as state variables especially the strains which cannot be stored so elastic strains if you remember they were from 1 to 6 so n tends is 6 for 3d cases so state variable 1 to 6 are stored are storing the elastic tensor strain tensor which is a total elastic strain tensor similarly 7 to 12 2 times 6 is 12 is storing the plastic strain tensor and similarly 12 plus 1 13 so state variable 13 is storing a scalar value of equivalent plastic strain and then return an end so this way you have updated the stresses all the state variables so the back is called the subroutine it computes everything updates the state variables and stress stresses goes back checks for the global convergence and then comes back and, and see if everything is fine or not and it keeps on going until you finish your analysis now what to do in the abacus input file or abacus cae and you need to give a name of the material dev variables in this case is 13 as you remember so you have to live with 13 and these are the total number of solution dependent variables and these are again coming from this so you remember 6 plus 6 plus 1 which is 13 state variables okay then we are storing all these state variables into different variables so i have given those values here six components of elastic strain tensor e six plastic strain components which are eps and the peeq is the plastic equivalent plastic strain which is a scalar value so when you define this in the user material subroutine then you need to also give the prop properties in the material definition card and in this case we have three number of properties which are young's modulus poisson's ratio and the yield strength and that is given here and this constant three basically signals the umat when it's called during the analysis that n prop c equals to three and in that case the prop one is this prop two becomes this and prop three becomes this so everything is automatically translated into umat which is mentioned here on this slide now so now let's create a simple one element input file for uniaxial loading and we try to compare it with abacus default material model because abacus already has a phone media's plasticity model so see you on the other side Okay, welcome to this side of the world and now we are moving towards more interesting part where I will try to first create a simple one element model and I will use default material model for phone plasticity then I will use a humor subroutine which I which we developed 
during this course and I will try to run the simulation and see if there are any similarities or if there are any issues we are facing. So let me create the part first. So we'll create a 3D solid extrusion part. I will create a rectangle from 0, 0 to 1, 1. So I'm giving a dimension of 1. And then I press this. And then I give a depth of extrusion to be 1 as well. So I have a 1 by 1 by 1 cube here. Next thing is the properties. And in this case, I will go to the material manager, create. And in this case, I will define the elastic properties. So I'm going to give a value of, let's say, 200,000 megapascals and a Poisson's ratio of 0.33. Okay. And then for plastic part, I will define the yield strength, let's say, to be 300. And at the plastic strain is of 0.0. Okay. So this means that after that, the yield strength will be the same. Okay, and then I go to the create solid section and then I will select solid homogeneous material and material one is the one which we just created. And then I will assign this material to this section, which is material one, solid homogeneous section one. So now it's green, this means material properties are working fine. I will instance this part to the assembly module since we only have one part, so we don't need to do any rotation, translation, tra rotation, translation, etc. operations. Now we go to the step definition, step manager, and I will create a general static step. I will, I can turn the energium on or I can turn it off. So let's turn it on for the time being. And then 10,000, because we can go with a very pl large plastic deformation as well. Also, I'm giving an initial time increment. Remember, this was the initial time increment where the strain rate is strain increment is decided by the solver, and the maximum is also 0.1. So, for a total time of one, if all the things go fine, then we will have 10 number of increments. If it doesn't converge in this size, then it will automatically start to reduce and it will go up to one exponent minus five in as a time increment size. Okay, so we have the step definition ready. There is no interaction needed for you loading. I will use the displacement boundary conditions. And in this case, for uni axial cases, I will fix three faces. This face in Z direction, this face in X direction, and this face in Z direction. And then I will pull from the other, uh, the other surface on the opposite to this surface in Z direction. So displacements, this surface, and I will select U3 to be zero. Then I will create another one, this surface and UY to be zero, U2. And then I will create another surface and UX to be zero. Now I will rotate it so that I can see this surface here or this face and I will create a boundary condition of, let's say, a U3. And I will give a value of let's say one. I'm not sure how much will cause the plastic deformation, so I'm just going. I'm going with a guess. And it's a ram. This speed will increase from zero to one in a linear manner. So it looks okay now. Now I go to the mesh, and I will say the mesh size should be one, so that I only have one element here. So if I now mesh. Then you will see it is only one element as it says in the bottom here. Okay, now meshing is done. So I'll go here and I will create a job. So I will say uni x here a b a q meets model. Again, I'm using a very long name. Again, it's your preference what you really want. I always ask for full precision. So that's what I have done and now I submit. So if everything is defined correctly, this should finish in no time. So this is the monitoring part and you see input file processor is fine. Now it's running and it finishes in no time. Okay, now if you go to the results, 
then you see it will expand in this direction as you see it's a pretty large deformation so now if i want to plot xy stress strain curve for this material i go to field output and then i say logarithmic strain in three direction because we are pulling in three direction and the stress in three direction as well and then i will select this element i will save the data so i will go to xy data manager create operate on xy data first combine absolute value of strain and absolute value of stress i should be positive but i'm just so default mat model okay then if i plot this then you see it's an ideally plastic material it yields at 300 and it goes perfectly fine so abacus model is working perfectly fine now now let's move to the user material subroutine and see how it behaves okay so to do that i think the easiest way for me would be if i go back to my directory so this is the input file which i just created in the abacus CAE. so it's better for me if i can just update this so here is this file i will just go to the editor and i will start updating the property so what i have to do here is i need to remember we need to get rid of all these things so i will just make them comments so double static is basically makes it comments and then we need to first define the depth variable command and then we have to give a value of 13 here next we need to define the user material property so i'm going to define for example user material constants equal to three and if you remember the constants were first one is things more or less second one is Poisson's ratio so i'm going to just copy paste that and the last one is the yield strength value because there is no hardening so that's what i have done here so also to tell which variable that variable is what i'm just copy pasting it here but i mean it, you don't you don't need to do it because we already are doing it in the code but this way it will give the name to the variables so let's run this one now and see what sort of curve we get so so to order to do that we need to have a command we have need to open the command prompt and then you have to write abacus job equals to again you can run it in cae as well you can have a look at some of the videos which are available on youtube but i prefer to do it this way because if something crashes uh, for example abacus ca has a tendency that for heavy subroutines it crashes you have to restart everything again but this is more stable and it takes less resources so abacus job equals to uni xl xl which is the name of the file input file user equals to umat plasticity for for run file then i always use full double precision and then interactively so now it will first start to do compilation so it's compiled then it did the linking of the file for trunk compiler umat file and now it's doing the pre-processing of the input file processing if everything is fine then see now it's running fine so hopefully now we should be getting the very similar curve as what we have seen for the default model okay so it's finished and now we need to process the results and for that i can open the odb file okay let me open these two models and one is the default model and one is the umat model odb file and then compare the results so this one is the umat model so if you look at the deformation it looks something like this if i plot create field output and i will select le33 because pulled in three direction and also s33 and then i will select the element press turn then save as is and then i will say xy data manager create operate on xy data and then i will plot i will combine them together so xx horizontal axis is strain vertical axis is stress 
and I will save as UMAT results. Okay, and I will press OK. I will just check for the show, be sure so it goes there, and then it yields at 300, and then we have ideal plastic case. Oh, delete. Now for the second case, which is the second model, default model, which is this one, again, we can see the deformation looks very similar. And in this case, again, we're gonna use the same variables and then do it again, create field output, same variables, LU33 and S33, because everything is pulled in this direction, press done and save. Okay, and then I will create, operate on XY data, and then I will say combine strain and stress. And then I will say abacus model results. Okay, I will delete the rest of the stuff. I will remove this. And now it's time to check. So this is the results from UMAT. And this is the one which I'm trying to add now. With that and you see they are all matching with each other they're going over the top of the each other and if you want to make sure that everything is correct and we're not missing anything you can go to the curves and maybe for this i can use some kind of legends and you see these legends will appear here if i use large you see these triangles are going all over each other so it's very much exactly the same results as we got from the default model so our umat is working perfectly fine now move, we move to the next part where we will look at the hardening model. So firstly, I will explain the theory in the next part and implementation part, which will be quicker because now you already know how to implement the model without any hardening. And then I will do the practical exercise as we have done it just now. So see you on the other side again. We now move to part 8, Numerical Implementation of Phone Mises Plasticity with Isotropic Hardening. We will start with the step 1, which was the same for the case when we had no hardening. So we will have elastic predictor step, where we are going to use a return mapping algorithm. I hope now you are familiar with that, what I mean by return mapping algorithm. We will first start by calculating the trial stress value based on the purely elastic behavior. This is also called elastic predictor step. We will also use this information to define the elasticity tensor, which describes the elastic stiffness matrix using Lamy's constants mu and lambda. So our stress increment relationship in terms of volumetric and shear part is given by this relationship here, depending on the Lamy's constants lambda and mu. And the elastic stiffness tensor, which is a fourth order tensor, is given by this in linear elasticity. So if you are still confused, then your stress tensor is generally written as the elasticity tensor with two dashes underneath and then epsilon. And that is basically your elasticity tensor. So generally this tensor has four indices because it's a fourth order tensor. These have two indices because these are second order tensors. So in Abacus, most of the time in matrix form, this fourth order tensor is stored as six by six matrix. And that is what I have written here because we will, in the, in the numerical implementation, we will be using it in this form. Now what we will do, we, we can determine the elastic trial stress using the relationship, which I again gave you before. So we will use the previous stress tensor value the elastic stiffness matrix, which is a fourth order tensor, or a six by six matrix, and multiply it with the strain increment, which is coming from the global solver for the current time increment. All the definitions are in terms of Cauchy stress, and the superscript pre previous is basically from the previous time increment. Then we will determine the trial equivalent stress which is also the trial phone mises stress and that's given by this relationship 
and when you expand these with in terms of indices then you can write it down in in this form in terms of the individual components the flow stress is determined from hardening law in the previous case where our hardening law said that flow stress is only equal to this thing yield stress this means we had no hardening but now since we have a hardening this means our stress strain curve would not look something like this but rather we will have some sort of hardening strain hardening so this means it will still have some resistance from the material after the plastic deformation sigma y initially yielding has been reached so this will be depending on the accumulated plastic strain and that's why your flow stress is function of the initial yield strength and also it depends on the plastic equivalent plastic strains at previous time t e is the young's modulus as before this is the yield stress and n is the hardening exponent depending on the hardening how how, how stiff this curve is you can you can basically calibrate this parameter okay so this is the only change from the phone mesis plasticity with no hardening that we only have this flow, flow stress is basically a variable and it depends on the equivalent accumulated plastic strain in the material. Okay, now we will do the elastic predictor step. And in this case, we will compare the value of the trial phone with the stress with the current yield stress value, flow stress value. And that is given by sigma E trial minus sigma F. Remember, in previous case, it was sigma Y because that was constant. But in this case, sigma F will be changing depending on the accumulated plastic strain in the material. So that's why it's there. And if it is less than zero, this stress is below flow stress or the current yield stress of the material. And hence we are in the elastic zone. We will update the stresses, which will be equal to the trial stresses. And also we will update the stress tensor, which will be equal to the trial stress tensor. Else, if it is greater than zero, then we have to determine the flow direction and also calculate the effective plastic strain using Newton method which we used in the previous case as well when there was no hardening. So the only thing now changed is the current tangent moduli as I showed you in the previous slide. So elastic yielding point and then hardening. So this hardening slope is changing throughout. So we need to define the tangent modulus for that and that is ET and that is given as Young's modulus times a hardening exponent times one plus E is again the Young's modulus and then the accumulated equivalent plastic strain at time t over sigma y raised to power n minus one and so this is basically the relationship we are using and this is motivated from this equation here because your slope of this line will be depend will be basically given as so this slope et or tangent model I will be given as the partial derivative of this sigma f with reference to equivalent plastic strain so if i take the derivative of this then you can easily see that this is n x raised to power n first so it will be sigma y times n and then the whole bracket one plus e epsilon p bar p bar t sorry i'm writing with a mouse and sigma y raised to power n minus one so it's typical de derivative formula and then i take the derivative of the inside because we have to use a chain rule so times and this will become zero because there is no epsilon p here while this has epsilon p so this will be e over sigma e raised to power sigma y and then the sigma y sigma y cancel out so we are having e times n times one plus this whole thing raised to power n minus one and that is what you see here as the tangent modulus in the plastic part of the curve so this is the derivative which i showed you just now okay and then we will use this incremental form to apply the plastic character step and as you remember this is again the same equivalent trial stress three times mu times the increment of equivalent plastic strain equals to the flow stress rather than the yield stress in the from the previous case and it's a function of the equivalent plastic stress strain as I showed you before. So now we will compute an incremental equivalent plastic strain 
So again, we will repeat the same Newton method. In this case, for a, in order to find that this increment of equivalent plastic strain, we need to iteratively solve this residual, which I gave you in the previous slide. And sigma f, remember, is a function of epsilon p as well. So we need to be it needs to be changed as the equivalent plastic strain keeps on increasing due to the hardening. Again, we're going to use the Newton method. So for the new value of epsilon p, we will use the previous value plus the, the this whole residual over the derivative of this residual with respect to delta epsilon. That is what is being done here. And I think I already explained to you before. So I'm just going to say that the new value of delta epsilon p would be the previous value plus the function value, which is this residual over the derivative of this thing, which will be 3 mu plus et, which is coming from the formula of this thing. And sigma f, which is, I already explained to you, we have used this kind of assumption that hardening is can be given by this. Again, if you look at Johnson and Cook model or some other power law hardening, then they have used a different relationship. So you can implement those easily as well, but just need to take the derivative as I showed you for the case of et in the previous slide. And et is given by this as I showed you after the derivative of this sigma f with reference to with respect to delta epsilon. So everything should be updated. So we need to add everything with this and then flow stress needs to be updated and then tangent moduli will also be updated based on the new value of delta epsilon p. And this cycle will keep on going until you find the residual to be approximately zero. Okay, so up, once we have done that, we will obviously obtain, we'll get the value of delta p by this, doing this, by minimizing this to zero, approximately zero. Then we will update the stresses, elastic strain, and plastic strain tensors, as we did before, using the same formulas which I gave you before, because there is nothing changing in this relationship here. Only thing which is changing is the sigma f, which is a function of accumulated plastic strains. Or Jacobian, again, we, it's a partial derivative of stress increment tensor over the, with respect to the strain increment tensor. So we, I'm going to use the same relationship which I gave you before. And that's why I cleverly use ET at that time, which was zero in the previous case when there was no hardening. But now you can use the actual values of ET coming from this calculation in the previous slide. So once we have done that, we will know Jacobian as well. And also, if you are working with the strains and stresses and Cauchy stresses and strains, then in that, in the case of, for the case of finite deformation, we can use the rod six subroutine as we did it before to move or rotate all the stress and strain definitions forward in the context of large deformation. So again, we're going to do the same for this case as well. In this part, we move towards the coding for the phone Mises plasticity with isotropic hardening. And the process is very similar. We will have to first copy the template of the UMAT in a text file or an Intel Fortran editor, which is very much the same as the previous part. The initial architecture, all that, all that variables I have already explained in the previous part. So I am not going to go through it again. Here you have to type your code and return and end will take the subroutine back after the updating of the stresses and state variables and other quantities which are needed. So firstly, we initialize the variables as we did before. I have initialized here the elastic strains, elastic strains, flow, direction, old stress values and old plastic strain values. Again, n tense tells, it's a three, if it's a 3D problem, as I told you before, it will be six. Similarly, the parameters like tolerance equals to one exponent minus six and the Newton iteration. I've used a maximum value of 20. So after 20 number of iteration, after the 20 iteration, you might will basically say that, okay, your plasticity loop has not converged and we need to do something about it. You can also increase this value to any value which you want. If you think increasing this will improve the convergence. You also initialize the Jacobian as I explained before and the material property is now uh, Young's model as Poisson's ratio, yield, initial yield strength value, and the hard, strain hardening exponent, Xn, which was capital N in the formula. Next, we initialize other variables. 
We recover the elastic and plastic strain and rotate forward using rod six. So that's what's been done here. Elastic strains and plastic strains are being taken from these state variables from one to six and then from seven to 12. And then they are rotated forward using rod six subroutine to account for the finite deformation. Similarly, equivalent plastic strain is 12 plus 130 as the as state variable 30. Next, we assign these stresses and equivalent plastic strains which are coming from the previous increment as old stress and old plastic strains. Next is a predictor step. So in this case, we have compute firstly the elasticity matrix as I told you mu and lambda. And then based on this relationship, we define the elasticity tensor, a stiffness tensor, which is given as the values. Again, I'm not going to explain that. You can work it out yourself as I explained in the previous part. Then we calculate the predicted stress and elastic strains using this relationship. We first compute the trial stress tensor and then we compute the equivalent trial stress value which is a formula stress in this case. Once we have done that we will just do compute the yield stress value based on the current equivalent plastic stress strain value. So we use the relationship which was sigma y times this plus Young's modulus times the equivalent plastic strain over sigma y raised to power capital N, which was this formula. Here. And then we determine if its active yielding is there or not, which is based on this function here. So again, we repeat the same exercise. And then if it's yielding, then we will compute the flow direction using the same relationship as before, which is the deviatoric part of the trial stress over the equivalent stress value. So everything is the same again from the previous part. Only thing which is changed is the sigma f value. Now we'll compute the incremental equivalent plastic strain values as before. So Newton method is needed. We first initialize the equivalent plastic to zero. Then we define the tangent stiffness matrix for the case of plasticity part using this relationship. Then we use this do loop to define first the residual part and then the updated value of the equivalent plastic strain increment using this formula, the right. And finally, the ET value using this relationship here. And if everything right hand side, which is this residual, is approximately equal to the tolerance, which is one exponent minus six times the yield stress value, very small numerical value equal to zero almost, then we exit. If not, then it keeps on continuing until we go reach to either convergence or we reach to the maximum number of iteration, which is 20 in this case. And if we reach to 20, then we have this will safe condition where we print a warning that okay after 20 iterations this loop hasn't converged so we need to look in detail what is going on with our parameters. Once we have found the increment of equivalent plastic strain using Newton method we basically have to update stresses, elastic strains and plastic strain tensor using these relationship here and again it's the same process so nothing has been changed here use that relationship finally only thing changes is the sigma f rather than sigma y finally update that equi accumulated equivalent plastic strain by adding updating the previous equivalent plastic strain with the newly found the increment of equivalent plastic strain we can also calculate the plastic strain energy density as i explained before using the relationship where this is the area under the stress strain curve Finally, we try to compute the consistent material Jacobian using the same relationship of partial derivative with reference to that. So again, I'm going to use the same relationship which I used in the previous part. Only thing which is changed again here is sigma f, which is changing as we are going as the accumulated plastic strain is increasing. So this is the only difference here. Rest of the formulas and implementation very much remains the same, and you, you might you can directly see from the previous case it is very much the same as before. If you again, if you don't find it hard to understand this equation and this, you can use some numerical technique. 
to do that. And again, for that, you can use CMO and use algorithm, which is quite frequently used to find numerically the material Jacobian matrix. Then we store the strains in state variables. So state one to six is elastic strains, seven to 12 are plastic strains, and 13 is the equivalent plastic strain. And then we are in the subroutine. This way we are, our implementation of UMAT code is finished. Get the material definition in the Abacus input file. So similar to previous case, we will have a material card, number of solution dependent variables. Again, in this case, we have 13 depth variables. And these are the variables as I assigned before. So these are very much the same as previous case. Material properties from three, now it is changed to four. So the constants in the input file should be four. And the four constants are the Young's model as Poisson's ratio, initial yield stress, and the hardening exponent. <laughs>
um, it should finish in no time. So it's completed in no time. We go to the results. We look at the results. They look something like this. Now I'm going to go and plot the XY data. So manager, create, field output. So logarithmic strain in third direction and S33. You can also plot mesial stress as well if you are more comfortable with that. Okay, we need to select the entity first, save as is, and done. And then create, operate an XY data, combine, strain, stress, save. This is the same thing as we did before, default model. And then we, if we plot, so it looks something like this as we give the values to this. Obviously, in this case, there is some kind of transition going on and the our function which we have used might not be able to give these kind of jumps because our relationship is more sort of this kind of function, but we will try to see if we can fit our parameters to this. Here is, so here is the file and now if I can edit this file and in this case, now I have to change the material definitions from the default model to our UMAT. So, as before, I will first make these as comments. Using double statics. And then I have to first define the depth variables. And again, we have 13, six elastic strains, six plastic strains, and one equivalent plastic strain. And I'm naming them as these. So I'm going to again use the same definition as I showed you on my slides. So first one, STV1 will be elastic strain one in one, one direction. And then similarly, EE, E22 and C3, so EE is elastic and strain and EP is a plastic strain. Then we need to define the coefficient. So from the previous file, if I copy that definition, and you remember we didn't never had any hardening exponent. So we need to have four because we are using four coefficients. And here we need to give some kind of exponent. And then I save it. Okay. And I should save it as UMAT. Okay, so now this UMAT file is there. So what I will do now, I will copy the UMAT subroutine as well from the previous folder. Both the files are in the same place. So now I'm going to go temp. And now I will say abacus job equals one element. Instead of default, it should have UMAT. Devil, no user was to new mat devil intersect interactively start with the compiler linking pre-processing of the input file and now it you can see everything is fine so it ran the analysis and it fin it is finished in no time so now i'm going to go back to my cae and open the same file here to see how the results look like which is this new mat file okay and then I will create field output, same variables, select this element, save as is. And then I will say create, operate on XY data, combine, train, stress, save. So this is UMAT. And close this, delete this. Now we'll plot this with the default model. So you see, this is the UMAT and this is the, this is our file here. So what I've done is I have used these parameters and by varying this to n equals to this, you can see I can get this kind of behavior. 
and if I change it to any other variable then you will see that there are many different types of response you can get based on parameters you have used so, so you can see how, how things really look like if you keep on changing the stuff so as you can see I have tried different values from 0 0.05 until even 1 as well and this model hardening model is not really flexible enough because and in this case you can see it is struggling to to fit the parameters what you can do in this case so now i have used the parameter of 0.2 and yield strength parameter or sigma y parameter to be 100 and it's yielding much earlier so maybe i can increase this parameter further maybe make it 150 and see what happens it should go up hopefully and because i'm trying to fit with the experimental data so let's see how it looks and this is how you basically do parameter fitting and when you have a stress experimental stress strain data available in real life once you have identified the parameters which fit perfectly with the experimental data then you have to then you can do the real time real structural simulations sometimes all hardening models cannot fit perfectly like this model is very limited because it has only two parameters so you have to also think about better models and you can have a different isotropic hardening relationship and that you can implement in the same subroutine as well so you can be more innovative and you can come up with, come up with a better hardening model as well now you can see it's a perfect fit yields at the same time as the actual data however it struggles to simulate this part and obviously for this part you need some kind of discontinuous function so you might have to add something more in your hardening law so that it has any enhanced hardening at this point when you reach to this kind of strain but this is how you basically fit your data with the actual experimental model and i hope now you have learned how to implement the phone basis processing theory with isotropic hardening and how to fit the parameters based on the experimental data so our implementation is fine and everything works perfectly